Hey, uh, welcome back from the break. And uh, for now, we will start the tutorial. Uh, this will be presented by Monty Wiseman and Avani Dave. And this is complete platform attestation, remotely verifying the authenticity and integrity of your platform's hardware, firmware, and software, which is actually not the longest uh, topic subject we've had at this conference. I think there was a longer one once. Oh, you mean, you mean the title? Yeah. Um, I think yeah. There, there was a previous one you put was <laughs> the uh, nation state security. Right. One. Yeah. We were trying to work for a while. So. Okay. Okay. okay, we'll get started. A crowd is shrinking. Um, so, yeah, as you said, my name is Monty Weisberg. I've been involved in, um, uh, I'm from GE Research. Um, formerly, many of you know of me as being from Intel. Um, but um, moved over to GE to do industrial controllers um, and try to secure the um, uh, critical infrastructure. So with that, with that in mind, one of the things that we think is really important is actually use TPMs for um, attestation and, and uh, more than just uh, sealing data. So we've been looking at this project, and um, I'm going to turn it over to um, uh, Avani, who was our intern over the summer, um, working on some of the research on the current state of um, attestation. So we're just going to kind of do a survey of what attestation tools are, uh, are available today. Um, it's not a complete list, but it is a partial list, as well as some of the work that we're doing um, in TCG to try to standardize, um, or in an effort to standardize some of the data structures so that we can continue to make forward progress on uh, this attestation program. Thank you, Monty. Um, so, attestation overview. Uh, as the title says that we are trying to achieve or say demonstrate proof of concept work for hardware, software, and firmware attestation as a verifier in one single platform. So um, just going for some overview of attestation, uh, TPM supplier signing certificate will be issued by TPM authority, like the vendor of it. It will create an EK certificate on the on the TPM hardware itself. Now, platform on which the TPM module will go with, it will have its own platform supplied signing certificate, which will be attested or say, which will be bind to the EK certificate which TPM is put on, the platform on which TPM is kept on. So the binding between the platform certificate and EK certificate is must for having the platform authenticity or for the attestation. That's for the part one of hardware attestation. Um, then software, so then comes the firmware. Is it okay? I, I just need to get off stage. Okay, yeah. So for the firmware part, um, so after that platform, we say that that's attested, then for the firmware part, what we need is like the firmware BIOS boot process will take place and then it will generate certain logs. Those are called the events log in TPM 2.0, event log structure, which is a CEL, canonical event log structure. We need a verifier which will verify first hardware root of trust, then firmware based root of trust, then comes the IMA part. Um, so integrity measurement, IMA. So, IMA event logs will be generated at, so, so after the boot process finish, finishes, it will take the measurement of different modules and it will create the IMA measurement that will go into the IMA event log. So that is called software event log structure. So if we say our platform is attested or verified, that means we need to make sure hardware, firmware and software up to certain level which we verify that is attested, it should be authenticated or verified. Uh, there is a RIM firmware um, specification which is reference integrity measurement firmware uh, specification which Monty is working with uh, NIST and they will be explaining the new standard which is coming up. 
There is also new standards for event log CEL format, uh, canonical event log for TPM 2.0 and there is IMA CEL format. So we are working on getting these three pieces combined together for having end to end attestation for the platform. The contribution which we make it in, the, in here is like, uh, we took the, we leveraged the tool already developed by NSA called HERS, H-I-R-S. What it does, it like, it will take the TPM supplied um, vendor EK certificate, it will authenticate it for the verifier part. Then it takes the platform certificate, it will take the root certificate, sign it the platform certificate and makes the hardware verified. Next part where our contribution comes is like we leverage the patches which was developed by um, Matthew Garrett of Google. Uh, and on top of it, we developed a utility which will convert the new standard of event logs into TCG specification 2.0. Uh, also, we had presented or say the team at GE uh, under with which whom uh, we, I'm working on, they have developed a IMA patches which will do the CEL conversion, canonical event log, or you can say the TLV format conversion, uh, tag length value format conversion of the IMA event logs. So we have combined IMA patches and we, meaning Monty and David Weiss, uh, David um, Seffert at GE presented in um, LSS 2018, the IMA event log patch and the utility. So we are combining IMA event log utility and we are combining kernel patches for CEL for event log together to have a unified place for single platform verification. Uh, now going into the background, do we need uh, some background of TPM? Uh, it's an audience question. If we say yes, then I'll hand over to Monty. Um, we need some basics on, no, okay. So then we'll go over. Us, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So then we go over. So going into some background of platform boot uh, process in order to understand how events logs are being generated and what we are trying to propose here for the new standard and what our utility will be helpful in that prospect. So when system boots, BIOS reset, reset vector will go on. After that, it will go to static root of trust measurement. Then it will take the firmware component one hash of it. Then it will extend it into some PCR value and it will create a structure into event log structure uh, for, for, the, for that particular uh, PCR extension. Similarly, the chain of trust will be established into the boot firmware by having next level of firmware hash measurement, extend it into the PCR and creating an event log for it. So on and so forth for all, for the BIOS boot process, it will create hash of each extended PCR, extend it into the PCR zero to seven. It will generate event logs in um, firmware event, firmware memory. Um, after that bootloader will go, it will create shim, shim hash of it, then it will store it into PCR extended, PCR eight or nine, and then it will create a event log of it. Next is extended boot process, grub two will be loading and whatever kernel module you have provided or whatever kernel you want to load it, that it will load the OS of it. It will create a event log structure for, event log for that as well. Next comes IMA. So this is where OS part comes. So uh, after OS boots up, then it will take the hash of certain parts which you want to make sure it's uh, authenticated or attested. You take the hash measurement of it, store it, extend into the PCR 10, and then it will create an IMA event log of what is attested at that stage. Uh, now, what is currently available in IMA is in different log format and event logs for the um, boot process or BIOS event logs are in different format currently. So the goal of this presentation or our contribution is to convert both event log structure 
n ima event log into cl format canonical event log format which is a new standard tcg uh, has uh, written it and published it for pc client specification so following that standard we have created a utility on top of matthew garrett's patch uh, to do firmware event log conversion and then after with last year's um, patch and utility we are converting ima event logs into cl format along with the hers and this two utility we say that we verify hardware then we verify firmware and then we verify the software which is running for the portion of ima um, so this is our end goal uh, and the contribution is to convert it into the cel new standard which is coming up um, so that being said um, we'll go to the next let's verify the hardware first part of it how we how we can say that uh, our hardware which we are trying to verify it's actually uh, attested or say it's legit in that in that terms so value proposition where this comes from it's like we get some hardware which will have its tpm module from x vendor it has its tpm module and we trust on that they provide it we ship it through some supply chain we it goes through some warehouses it will go into the installer location we by default current current time we trust on all the levels with it and we say that if it has a public key for ak and uh, attestation key then we use that at the installer location and we say that it is authenticated uh, what happens with this is like uh, if we don't have a root of trust established between the platform supplier and ek certificate which we are getting it from their tpm module uh, certificate then there can be the case of counterfeiting and that can be so with use of this particular root of trust measurement and hers particularly in that terms we can reduce the cost and we can increase the trust between the supplier and the tpm vendor and across the supply chain so that op operator or plant operator can verify all this thing with hers attested that's the proof of concept work um so you can verify it and this can be beneficial um next is um ek to platform certificate binding as i said before also what happens is like the ek certificate tpm supplier will give its tpm supplier certificate which will, which will be loaded into the tpm module itself with having tpm attributes of it that will be bind into the pcr one value of it then platform supplier will provide its root of trust measurement and platform certificate this platform certificate is referenced or bind to the tpm which it actually loaded onto that platform so now a vendor has a tpm which is associated with this particular platform we are making a binding between the tpm vendor and the platform certificate so that root of trust measurement is required in that case so ek certificate will be generated um, for the root of trust measurement now what happens in this case is like tpm supplier certificate and t uh, platform supplier certificate we transfer it one time trusted channel we are using it to transfer these two certificates to the platform owner we say that platform owner gets through this channel both the certificates what we do is like we put the, we validate that we sign the platform and tpm modules with those certificates and we say that it are tested now this can be enlarged or say we can leverage this particular mechanism for having multiple um actually one more slide here so with this similar method we can validate multiple platforms with same ek and platform certificate say thousands of in a warehouse thousands of chips will come in the same way so like el enlarging the concept of validating ek and platform binding 
to make validation that this particular TPM is tied to this particular platform and we are validating that. And in a warehouse, there can be thousands of chips coming in and we are validating it for platform as well as EK for that. Um, one, one thing, uh, I am going back to one slide to explain that how ownership or say platform AK is established after that. As I said, platform binding with the EK certificate is done. What we do after that is like we will do the association of ownership to that particular TPM module. So owner will get the key certificate, which is an attestation key, which will be like verifying this platform. After that, verifying EK. What it does, it like verify the first platform certificate sign signature, then verify the EK certificate signature, then verify EK belongs to that platform. And then we say that if both of them matches, then we can say that, okay, now we can generate an AK uh, attestation key for that particular platform. So this is the owner's establishment part of it. After that, um, okay, so now we are going for the demo. Uh, for the first part, Hirsch, and then we will go for the demo of event log, and the next is IMA event log for that. Um, so for the setup of Hirsch, I'm using a box client, which is a CentOS 7 uh, verifier. And on my local, I have Hertz Provisioner installed. So I'll just provision a TPM with that. So side by side, I'm just showing two things. On my local, I'm running Hertz Provisioner. So provisioner on this side, on the terminal, which is having a TPM module. So the device which we are provisioning it, which should have a TPM module on it. And the verifier doesn't need to have a TPM. But for end-to-end -end verification, if you want, you can have a software TPM, um, IBM's implementation of a software TPM with T TCG stack or uh, IBM stack, and you can verify codes on both the side to say that it's attested. Uh, for the proof of concept for now, um, I'm showing first, Hertz provisionary started, and then I'm, so this particular step, what I'm making is like I'm, So I'm running the provisioner now. So what it does, it like it first goes onto your system which has a TPM module, configuring the provisioner, deleting existing EK key stored into that, then provisioning the particular platform, creating an endorsement key, sending it over to the verifier on this side, which is a VM in this case, and then it will be creating all relevant with a new nuance, nuns, so that every time it's a fresh uh, connection between the client and verifier. So now, second part of it, which I want to show is like, here with, we have a policy set. So what we can do is like, we can make sure without 
all policies and with policies I'll show you two cases where we can specif we can verify each certificate being evaluated on or say verified it on. Uh, so first I'm just disabling all. So as you can see that three basic certificates I have already preloaded into the store of the verifier at this moment just for the demo purpose. Uh, those are endorsement credential certificates. So uh, this is the root certificate, root CA certificate. We get it from the platform supplier. So first endorsement certificate. I have already put that into the verifier store for now uh, for my platform, which is like uh, Intel's uh, TPM, Intel's uh, NUC and having a TPM module of 022. So I have already put the root certificate into the store. Then I have created, so NSA has a utility called PECOR. So which it, what it does it like with that, I have created platform credentials, validation certificate, and I have created signing key. So that is platform attributes. So we sign, we, and I have put both the keys into the store for the verifier. What it does it at this moment when I run again the verify or say ACA utility on the terminal, what it will do is like it will verify without any certificate check at this moment. And I'll show you into the UI part. Um, first I'll show you without and then I'll show you with um, in the UI part. So right now the last test which we had it, it had all three greens because it was verifying endorsement key, it was verifying platform certificate and it was uh, checking the signing key as well. So platform attributes, it was verifying it. Now I am running it with all three disabled. So you will see a line which is blank, which is not checking any of the certificates in this case. So again, Now if I refresh, yeah, so it's not checking any of the certificate. I'll make sure now one more run just to have the policy set, all three certificates will be verif verified in that case. So it gives us or as a user or a verifier a way to verify all the root certificates and platform binding with it. So that first step, hardware root of trust verification is done with the HERS part of it. So. I made all three enable and as I said, I have already loaded the certificates into uh, the store for now. So if I run again, and refresh, check the reports, all three are verified. So if there is any breakage or if there is some counterfeited part or some malicious code injection in that certificate creation or somewhere else in the line, we can say that hardware is not verified at that point. Now comes to the second part, which is firmware validation. So and it that too into CL format. So the next demo is for Before we go into the firmware, so this is a good breaking point here. Why don't we see if there's any questions on what we've done? Is as she said, we verified the hardware platform. I'm sorry, it's because it's not on. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so so this is a good breaking point. Um, if, you, if you have any questions, the, um, we've got a pointer. This is um, provided by. Um, the, the NSA proof of concept code, um, uh, and there's, there's a link to it that she's been playing with, but there's, um, th there's a little more to it if you want to ask any questions um, about where we are at this point, because we're going to leverage, on, we'll leverage this onto the next point, uh, onto the next phase. Yeah, and um, to extend his say, um, NSA's tool is supported on CentOS 7 only. The problem which we had it is like CentOS current version of the kernel is 3.10 on the main line, which doesn't even have TPM 
uh, event log part. So in order to or say get it up to the patch level of 5.2 kernel or above 5.3 kernel in order to get TPM 2.0 event log, we have to either port the kernel to or patch the kernel to 5.2 or higher or we can port it into the Fedora kernel. So what we have done is like we have ported it to the Fedora. So like right now NSA is um, the tool which you said saw it here it is running on Fedora. So we ported it to Fedora, uh, Fedora 30 um, and still ACA provisioner or say the verifier it is still running on CentOS 7. So both are in different flavor just for little bit detail on that. Um, Any other questions? Yeah, as you said we, we would like to see this a little more portable and one of the things we would like to work on over the next year is to make this so that it can very easily be moved from one environment to the other. Uh, one, one of the problems, just as kind of an aside, um, is that platform certificates, and this is why it's a little more restrictive, platform certificates are in fact attribute certificates, they're not key certificates. And the only library we could find to manage keys or attribute certificates was Bouncy Castle. So they were restricted to write most of this code all in Java. We can't seem to get the open source community to support attribute certificates. If you know anybody who will help us along that, that area, that would be really nice. Then we could be a little more flexible and write all of this in C. So anyway, that was one of the obstacles that, that they have as well as, the, the, as well as what we have as well as just the most common tool out there doesn't support um, attribute certificates. So uh, going on to the next part which is event log, event log 2.0 structure. Uh, what I am taking is like I am taking a fresh uh, event log measurement from my system, system kernel security, TPM0, binary runtime measurement and then I am putting it into temporary measurement. What happened? Okay. Since I am on system kernel I need to be sudo. Okay. So now I have it in temporary measurement, the event logs, which I just captured it. Now I'm running it, the utility which we developed it to convert it into or say parse it into the uh, new CEL format, canonical event log format. Uh, so this is our utility. Um, it's the source code and everything is available on GitHub. So we'll be sharing the GitHub link for you guys to try it on and for the feedbacks. Temporary measurement. So now this is the new CEL event logs format. There are some events which are like humongous in terms of a data size and which we are not, um, do not know the reason like why they are of this big of an event data size. Um, like this. Yes, this yes. is firmware. Yes, this is firmware. Yeah, uh, and this is new uh, uh, CEL or TPM 2.0 event log structure. Um, so this is the first event which is actually in the form of 1.2 format, which will say us the information about what algorithms it support. So here you see that uh, it supports two algorithms, which are those, so these are the hashing algorithm by the way, SHA-1, SHA-256 are on. Uh, so in the utility I have created enum for support of right now at SHA-1, SHA-256 and SHA-384 but if in future if you want to extend it just add the enum value and it should be flexible to support that as well. Most of the vendors or say this particular NUC system which we have evaluated uh, it supports only SHA-1 and SHA-256. BIOS also, so BIOS will tell you like what it supports on and you can turn it on and off the bank and do the uh, analysis the way we did it. So here 04 is SHA-1 and 0B is SHA-256. So two algorithms SHA supported for from the event log 1.2 structure. As you can see here, all the event doesn't have both the algorithms supported. That's one of the observation which we um, observed while we got the log passed out. Um, as you can see here, and we have made a 
checking on the on the run while it is parsing it whether both the event types are matched or not so number of algorithm supported matches meaning like it has both the events of sha1 and sha256 because the 1.0 event log structure specifies it has two types there will be some events where both the algorithms are not supported in at this moment that's the observation we are getting it so these are the bios event log which we are parsing it so um, oem vendors uh, needs to have a consistency across uh, different sha uh, supports if they say that bio supports this hashing algorithms so then they should have consistency between all the events uh, which we are seeing it on here so that's uh, one of the observation there is one more utility or say there is one more script provided associated with this utility to run it multiple um, binary blobs for the demo purpose we i have provided one test file a uh, test file folder which has couple of binary blobs for uh, different sets of algorithms and then you can run a report on those saying like this many algorithms matches or not uh, that's the additional work which you can evaluate it on so that's first part second is ima So for IMA, um, we have to first uh, sign in in order to um, say verify the signature or say get the event log of IMA. This particular utility, what it does, it like first we will do it sign the files. Uh, one second. Okay, I have it. I have it in different. Actually, leave it. So we have a shell script which was uh, which is already posted on GitHub, uh, which will do the signing process. But for the demo purpose, what I'll show you it is I have already created. Okay, so. With current state of IMA event logs, what is happening is like it currently stores into the memory. It doesn't get released because we don't have a syncing and uh, serializing process. With CEL format, we take the uh, event log of IMA and then release the memory block after exeboot services. So that means that being said, that memory is being freed up. So we are clearing that portion we have provided the utility um, for that as well to demo the ima part i already have created same um, data blob as i did it for okay where am i oh yeah that's the thing Okay, here. Okay. 
sorry, I was in wrong folder for that and that's why I was not finding the utility. Uh, so here, IMA signing, we'll do the signing on the files which we are going to, uh, IMA sign.sh, we'll do the signing first. Um, it needs to be sudo. As you can see that it's, it will sign the files which are, which we are doing the, or say, be, which will be using it for IMA provisioning or say IMA event log creation eventually. So it does the signing of it first. Then after we'll use the utility to run on the event log to parse it into CL format. This will take some minutes, some time. Any question? On so, yeah, so while we're waiting, does everybody understand the issue about where IMA retains the log in memory? It's often been described as a memory leak. Um, we had no way of extracting the log out before and be able to go back again and put it together unless you did a lot of, you know, managing of just blobs of data. Uh, one of the advantage, the one of the key advantages of the CEL, and she'll show that in a later slide, is that we're adding sequence numbers to each one of these events. So what you can do now is, she's gonna show, is we're gonna pull the event logs out, put them into this new format, and, if, and with this patch that David Safford has, it will actually free up the memory inside the kernel for the next set of measurements that come down. So you don't lose them, you have to save them in a file someplace, but they're now sequenced, you can send them out, you can, um, uh, or store them on the local disk for sending out later, or analysis, but because they're sequenced, you can now append them back together again. And as we skipped over the tutorial, um, as hopefully everybody knows, the extend sequence is, uh, you have to maintain the sequence, uh, or none of it has any value. didn't grab the fastest machine for this, by the way, so that was <laughs> one of our problems. And Oh, taking this long before. No, it was. So it yeah, it. Yeah, so, yes, so, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a file, but the integrity of the file is verified by the quote of PCR 10. So it's, it's self, I mean, it, Well, when you reboot, it starts at zero.
Yeah, the, with David's patch, the kernel does, at each boot, the, the, the sequence starts at zero again. Okay, so you're starting in kernel. Starting in kernel, and then as the thing's running, it will just continue to accumulate them until, let's say we get to, I don't know, 580, make up a number, right? Uh, if you've got a really busy system. You go read this with her utility. With previously, when you read the pseudo file, it just said, and when you go read it again, it's the exact same information, right? Now, when you go read the pseudo file, it'll return the information, assume you've kept it, and it'll, in my case, it'll start, oh, oh, it'll start with sequence number 581, right? When you reboot it, it goes back to zero. Yeah, so now this one is done, signing is done. I already have a TLV underscore data, which is a binary blob of TLV data. So I'm running this uh, tool against TLV, and this is the sequence number which uh, we were just talking about for the IMA event logs. Previously, it was not there, so with this new patch and the utility, we are getting the sequence number for IMA as well. Uh, and you can see that we are doing a check on PCR10, calculated matches the original one which was supposed to be there. So um, we are validating that as well. And because since this has very large number of events in there, um, I'll just don't, I do not want to go to the top of it, but yeah, all the events are there. So now with this two, uh, the utility of both, both the side, IMA and event logs, we have both in CL format, the new, TCG 2.0 event log structure. Uh, so here you can see that for event logs, we have the numbers, event numbers. I started with event number zero for 1.2 mm -hmm. format event. So that, that says like this will be supporting this many algorithms and whatnot, the information about the platform a little bit on that. And then event number one is actually TPM 2.0 first event and so on and so forth. Uh, and for the IMA TLV, this is the parser for it. Basically, that's kind of the demo part of it. Going back to the presentation. Uh, it, maybe it's kind of a summary. Go back to the, uh, the, the boot sequence. Oh, so yeah. Make sure everybody's sure, on the same. Sure. Kind of give a visual. Yep. Yeah, that one. So, yeah, so what we've done now is before uh, coming out of the, um, the the very top one memory, uh, basically it was a blob of C structures, which is how the UEFI keeps it, and they're not even sequenced. So if you break that blob of data up, and as you can see in the demo here, it was actually quite large, larger than I was expecting it to be. Um, you've got to you've got to maintain that, and it's not. I mean, you've got tools. Obviously, we can digest C structures but it's much better off being able to convey this information in some standardized format. Uh, we defined TLV, which she'll describe in a minute. Uh, but it's also just as important to make sure that the stuff coming out of IMA and the stuff coming out of the firmware are formatted the same so we can have a common set of uh, verifiers. Yep. Oh. These, we have some screen captures just for like a backup for us, like just in case demo doesn't work at times. So we had in slides, so like people who wants, and yeah, there is a negative test scenario also, like where the certificate doesn't match, you obviously get a red indication on the horse provisioner with saying that that certificate doesn't match. So we covered that as well. Um, and here is HERS captures a little bit detail about the platform on which we did the provisioning. It says like these are irreplaceable components, the red ones, and the other it gives the NIC card information and uh, REST drivers and some uh, what's running on the platform related information. So if somebody changes a particular component of a platform, the verifier gets notification of that, whether it wants to trust it or not, or again, root of trust needs to be established in that case. We can go and dig into the details for the verifying of the platform and AK, EK and AK generation after that. Now I'm, I'll be um, 
Okay, yeah. So this was, so last year we did the, Monty and David Seffer did from the GE group, did the presentation on in LSS 2018. We have a link for that as well in the presentation. Uh, so they, de they explain what is canonical event log record structure. Uh, as you can see that it has a record number, it has a PCR number, and these are all in TLV format, tag length value format. So um, we, have, we have showed you first utility of it, and now we are showing you the canonical event log structure just to be on the same page. First it's record number, then PCR, then digest. If it is only supporting SHA-1, then that will be the digest of it, and the event which will have the event size and then event type, the, the data of it. And these will be going into the each cell record. So t dot, uh, tpm2.0, if I have that open, we can verify it. It's on the new structure. So this is the structure for event log, which uh, it's explained in, into the presentation itself. Record number, PCR digest, and event contained itself. Um, here is the link for the last year's LSS presentation, which we did it. There is a video set, video also available, and slides available for people who wants to uh, review that material as well. Um, we already covered the demo for both of them. Uh, now I'll be transferring it to Monty for reference integrity measurement, the next topic or yeah. new standard coming up from NIST and TCG. Yes, yeah, so we don't have any tools on, yeah, just get to the camera here. Mm -hmm. We don't have any tools on this yet. We thought we would, what we would do, this is a, a very um, early stage of, uh, of development and what I wanted to do is at least introduce the concept that we are working on for how to produce the reference measurements uh, from for the firmware. So right now, our focus is entirely on the firmware. As uh, Avani mentioned, there are some upcoming um, uh, NIST standards that are going to start re um, requiring OEMs to provide the reference measurements for their BIOS as, as they're coming out. Um, and this is an effort to help provide help OEMs provide a standardized version of, um, of doing that. So um, with, with that, what, um, what we're working on right now is we you know, kind of surveyed the, um, the, what we currently have, we being TCG, and there's actually a spec out there for reference measurements, um, but we looked at it and it's actually pretty old, um, and it was pretty hard coded to XML, and we thought maybe hard coding to XML might not be a uh, 2019 solution. Um, and we also looked at it and we found only one vendor currently using it. I think it was StrongSwan was using it and um, in some very limited cases. So with, with that, we were kind of um, enabled, if you will, to kind of start from scratch, say let's, let's see what we can do and um, pro provide some new thinking on this. So as I, in my question earlier to, to one, of the, um, uh, one of the other presenters, one of the things that we started looking at is, well, let's not reinvent the wheel. Um, let's actually start from something that's very, very much in use today and see if we can, uh, see if we can make use of it, extend it, and rather than creating yet another set of tools that, that people have to use, one of our problems though is we're, 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 doing, we're providing the reference measurements for something that's very different from a file, right? So, but regardless, we thought, well, let, let's look at this and see if we can make this work. So we took the notion of SWID tags and, and thought, well, they're, they're very heavily used and we think that they're gonna be more used um, in the, in, uh, going forward. And as I was point, pointed out earlier, it is based on an ISO spec, but NIST was nice enough to produce NIST IR8060. Uh, As any of you know that if you've bought an ISO spec, they're not cheap. Um, so you can go off and read 8060 and probably get about 95% of what you need out of buying it. So it's quite a discount. Thank you for the US government for doing that. 
So anyway, the link is there to go get it, and that's pretty much the standard that we are uh, working from as our basis. Uh, as I also mentioned earlier in the question, in, 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 a, in a question to a previous presenter, is we uh, there's also an effort to provide SWID tags because uh, SWID tags are XML, so that wouldn't have solved the problem. But if we start with an information model and uh, which is essentially what we're doing with SWID tag with with this new format, we're going to say, well, this is the information you need to convey. Among one of the ways of doing it is going to be this XML-based ISO standard, but thanks to um, uh, a colleague of mine working in PCG Hank, um, they, they are actually working on um, uh, CoSWID, which is a um, concise, um, concise binary format instead of XML format. So there's a link to it there. Um, I just saw some recent news on it this morning. I think it's been promoted um, as a draft or something like that. So it's moving right along. So you're going to be able to represent this information, provided we continue with this wood tag, which all indications are that, that we are going to. Um, you're going to be able to represent it as in, 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 uh, uh, in either XML or in um, uh, concise binary format or any other format that somebody wants to come up with. We envision, for example, a JSON format. Um, again, because how we're going to do this is based on an information model. Here's the information you need to convey, and, 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 um, and it's up to a binding specification, a binding protocol for exactly how to map that to a particular set of data structures. Um, and, and, and part of the reason that we, um, we want to stick with SWIT tags is there's a number of tools, open source tools available, uh, and uh, software developers are already used to doing this, although OEMs, um, it's kind of a different namespace for them, but at least they can start from, from a common set of tools that, um, that we have. So um, I'm just trying to yeah, make sure I cover everything there. Okay, so as I said, the, the problem with SWID tags, though, is, you know, SWID tags, if you look at the, at, 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 uh, at the attributes in the SWID tags, um, they have an attribute in there for identifying files and where those files are located. Um, but there are no attributes that map into something like a PCR index, and a, which is critical, and a, um, and, and a sequence number if we want to provide a set of golden measurements or reference measurements for all of the events that Ivani was showing you in, in, in her presentation. So we needed some other way to solve this besides we entertain the notion of just simply adding in a bunch of new attributes. We have to put them into either a custom area or we can go to ISO and try to get them to standardize on a new set of attributes. And neither one of those solutions seemed like, they seemed like they were gonna to be too much work. Um, so, and, and so we also thought it was gonna add a bunch of bloat. So we decided to do that, uh, decided not to do that. So. How we decided to solve it was, as been mentioned many times, all problems can be solved with yet another level of indirection. So this is our current proposal for solving that. On the right-hand side is what's called the base rim. So the base rim is a, an, a SWID tag with, we haven't added any, any new attributes to it. Um, and what we're doing is we're looking at this thing called the payload, which again was mentioned earlier. So inside the payload, and you can have multiple of these payloads inside of a SWID tag, we are gonna use those, and this is where we thought, well, we'll add a new type of thing called PCR attribute instead of payload and substitute it. So that would be PCR index and event or you know something. And, and as you saw from the, from the screen, these events can be quite large. Uh, what we decided to do instead was use what's there and use the file attribute to point to something new. This is the level of indirection. So we're gonna create these, a definition for these RIM support files. And the RIM support files will have information like PCR index, and this, again, this, our focus right now is on firmware. It will have things like PCR index and sequence number and the information that you need, that, that you wanna convey. And, and I'll go into a little more detail of the two classes of information, actually, there. They're on the slide, we're looking at the OEM can provide the raw, the ending PCR value itself, or this can also contain, here's the list of 
of uh, events that you will see, for example, in the, um, uh, in, in, in the display that uh, Ivani showed. So these will simply point to a, an array of these support files, and we are, the, I'm only showing two of the attributes here, but these are the only two we really need to change, or make use of, I should say. One is the file, it points to the, the support file, and then of course is the hash of the support file. We don't see a need to sign each support file because the hash of each one is inside the SWID tag, and then we're gonna mandate the SWID tag be signed because that's an option for a SWID tag. Oh, thank you. I got too close. I get too animated. All right. So, so basically the SWID tag is going to be signed and that signature is gonna provide the integrity of all of the support files. So whole, this whole thing will be some, we're calling this an instance. And again, the names and things may change, but this is kind of the direction that, that, that we're heading right now. All right, so um, I think that changed. Oh, so I'm not in page mode. All right, so the, 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 the format of the specifications we are gonna be producing is we're gonna start, as I mentioned before, with an information model. And you're not gonna be able to do anything with this information model except write another spec. And, the informa and, and, and this gives us the flexibility, as I indicated earlier, of having this information in different types of formats depending on, on the particular use case. So the information model is simply going to describe, I'll go to this previous, will simply describe the information that has to be in the base RAM and the information that has to be in the support file but it's not gonna talk at all about what format it should be in and how, what sort of standards. It might even just be a wire format, it might not even be a file format. Right. And then after that, there will be a, what's called the, these binding specifications. And you know, the first one we're gonna talk, talk about is obviously the binding specification for how do you represent this stuff on a PC client, or we call it a PC client, but everybody leverages off of that specification, the servers typically use all of the, the, the PC client specs, the, um, the, the network grade equipment uh, work group uh, uses that as well. Um, so we are gonna define two types of support files, as I mentioned before, um, and, the, and the first type is gonna be a uh, snapshot of the, um, uh, uh, actually I'll start from the bottom, the, the simplest format would be a snapshot of the individual PCRs. And I'll show that in a minute. The second will be a, a long list of all of the events, very similar to what, what Ivani showed. Here's all of the events that uh, the OEM, that should come out maybe out of the golden measurements when the OEMs first produces it. And then the final thing that this binding specification will provide is where do you put this stuff? Where do you distribute this stuff? And uh, I, I will go and we, I think during a Q and A we can have a debate uh, about how this is. We have, uh, I'll show one proposal in a minute. So this is an example here of a very simple set of measurements that the OEM can provide. And one would, I'm just calling this for right now, aggregate PCRs. So in this very simple case, the OEM or the IT department, it doesn't mean this stuff has to come from the OEM, we want it to, but uh, on legacy systems, they may not have produced them. That doesn't mean you can't have this stuff today. Somebody can take a system into a lab that they believe is pristine, and the BIOS is good, nobody's tampered with it, nobody's updated it, and you can just do PCR reads and get this information out of here. So this is the expected values for PCR zero through seven, for example, which is what the PC client defines. In which case, that's all you really care about is this, is maybe it's a single per point, point of sale terminal. Uh, it's not something that's supposed to change from boot to boot. And we certainly don't expect people to be updating the firmware. So in this case, the use case might very well be, it's perfectly fine to distribute the golden PCR measurements for, I just depicted zero, two, and four, but all seven of them, for example, in this one aggregate, or this one uh, RIM firmware instance and have simply just distributed it. Now what I can do is I can hand this to a verifier. The verifier perform the steps that Ivani talked about earlier, go give me your, um, your, your quote information, 
and I'm simply going to do a comparison operation on these. The other choice, this is actually what Ivani showed, the other choice would be, I want more detail. If PCRs don't match exactly what the OEM said they should be, I want to be able to decompose this and identify something in the middle. For example, and kind of a silly use case, but I've actually seen it, where somebody simply swapped the PCI cards on the bus. Well, the BIOS goes through and enumerates the PCI cards, takes a measurement of the BIOS visible portion of the option ROM is the older term, the uh, EFI application that might be sitting on, on there, in which case the PCR2 in this case will be very different at the end. But if you actually look at the events in there, the only thing that changed is the card in slot two, the, that event, is, and three are now swapped around. So if you had a more sophisticated verifier, someone would be able, if they received something like this from the OEM or from a trusted source, they would actually be able to go through, well, PCR2 is different, but why is it different? And be able to go through and, and look through these, or maybe you added a card. That would be probably a better case. You added a card, well, of course, PCR2 is going to be different. But I've got this event in the middle of it that I wasn't expecting, but, okay, it's, someone's authorized to open up this this machine and put this card in here, so that's okay, I'm gonna let this thing on the network. Because that event, that, that particular digest matched what was claimed, I can go look that up if I want to. This is a lot more work, but a lot more flexible. We're gonna provide, we're proposing to provide the option to do both or either one of these formats. Uh, let's see. So what, what do you end up with then is, again, what we're calling a bundle. We're just making up these terms for now, is in, in the top case, you'll have this array of, of um, here you're providing the detailed events for the log. Um, you can see, and this is very simple, right? it'd be much bigger than this. Uh, you'd have one of these for, for each of the seven PCRs. And then of course, down the vertical column, you would have each one of the events that within the log that are associated with that particular PCR, so this would be an awful lot of information uh, to pass. The, the bottom one, obviously, is a simpler case where you just have one RIM firmware instance and where you've got you know, one RIM, uh, one SWIDTAC structure that simply points to, in, in, in this example, three, but in reality, it could be uh, eight, zero, PCR zero through seven for each one of the preview PCRs. Now, how do you distribute this stuff? Um, obviously, one way of doing it is you can provide a well-known URL to, um, to, to go get them, and I think that's going to be a viable solution. Another solution that uh, we would love feedback on um, is maybe we allocate in the, inside uh, the, the boot partition a new place, and we're just calling it TCG slash manifest, where the OEM can place this information onto the boot drive before they ship it. Now, obviously there's problems, what happens is you swap out the boot drive. All right, so we're gonna have to find a solution. That's why th my personal belief is we're gonna have to support two of them. The first, having it in locally on the machine for convenience, but I think the, the whole notion of that's the only place it is, and if you swap out your drive, you're out of luck, and I don't think that's gonna fly. So I think there's gonna have to be some way of replacing it and obviously going back to the OEM and asking the question, given the model number, um, it, it is obviously going to be a, um, um, uh, I, I think that's going to have to be an option. But again, we're just working through this. The point of this discussion, uh, the point of this uh, is to give you the background, the tutorial on all the attestation. This, we believe, is pretty much the final piece because we believe we have the canonical event log that we can provide to the verifiers in a standardized format, hopefully producing a diverse and rich set of verifiers out there. And, and we have a list of the existing ones um, out there in, in, in the market today, and there are actually more than I was expecting, so that's actually good news. Uh, I would like everybody to start using these standardized formats so that vendors or customers don't get locked in to a particular set of solutions, a particular OEM, what we really don't want is OEM1 producing um, uh, RIM or you know, RIM formats in one 
for what, what their favorite way of representing it. And then OEM2 does it a second way, and then OEM3 does it a third, and these poor verifiers are gonna have to go through and parse every one of them. And then if somebody new comes along the block, then they have to go figure out how to plug that one in. And the same exact thing for the series of events coming from the, the platform, although we have a little more control over that. Anyway, so here's the, we have a whole page of cool things that we found. Um, some new things we didn't even know about. Keyline was kind of a cool project. I actually learned about this week, so I'll be doing some, some reading on that. But um, anyway, that's pretty much our, our presentation. We're just about, got about 20, 20 minutes, I guess, for discussion. Any questions about um, the effort that we're doing? Again, the, the effort on the rim is very active within, within TCG, and we'd be very much interested in getting feedback before we get too far along. I don't think they, they, they don't appear, and Ivani's done a little more research than I have, so correct me. Um, they don't appear to deal with platform certificates. So the, the HERS project ends at the delivery of an AIK, or sorry, old school, AK. Attestation uh, key. Yeah. The attestation key that for some we had one architect didn't like the I. Um, so um, HERS ends at delivering an AK. Right, and that's it, that's as far as it goes. Um, you know, we, she and I talked about, well, what if we expand it? Firm believer in kind of the Linux concept, right, of let each tool do its thing. And, and I think hers, getting hers to stop at provisioning the system. Here's the AK, and you know, going back to, going back to uh, what she showed here. Um, sorry for the put this into slide mode, but um, one of these displays, I don't know, actually, I don't think we have a display. Um, yeah, actually, it's this one here, yeah. The, this top key, do I have one first here? Yes, I do. Right, once, this is the AK, I should have labeled it better. Hmm. <laughs> that was my fault, it's my slide. Um, once this key is delivered, it's signed by every, all the other keys on this system are signed by an entity outside of the owner, either the TPM vendor or TPM supplier, the platform manufacturer. But once you get to here, that key is signed by the owner, you know, the facilities or whatever. At this point, they should make the claim, this is a valid platform, I've already checked it out. The rest of this, everything on this slide can just go away, as far as that owner is concerned until the system is, 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 is reprovisioned. So, I still believe that this is where her should end. Right, this is, does a great job of getting us there. From this point, you get a key, and now you use that key to test the firmware, to test the software as, you know, Ken's got some tools that, that does this, Keylime does this. I think that's where Keylime starts, is assuming you've got these, uh, actually I think it starts with an EK, doesn't yeah. start with a platform certificate. Problem with an EK alone, which is why I like, you know, this is, I think, to me, this is the end game. You know, I have a little little daughter board for a Raspberry Pi. And it's got an Infineon TPM. And that Infineon TPM is just as good as the Infineon TPM that's inside a $20,000 router, right? No difference between them. What's different is what platform it's on. The platform certificate says this thing's good, right? So we can throw all this stuff away. But once I get that key, I'm done, and then I can move up the stack and start testing the firmware, the stuff that the owner actually cares about. Okay, thumbs up, thumbs down, and using SWIT tags. Just, that's kind of, I think there's two things I want to walk away from, from this is, are, is SWIT tag the right approach? I mean, because at the end of the day, if this goes forward, you guys are going to have to deal with it. Speak now or forever hold your peace until the next patch. No? Yes? Okay, everybody likes with tags. <laughs> um, what about where to put it? I think I saw a groan. 
I don't know, I might have misinterpreted. They might have been reading email, who knows. Um, now, if we need to put it local, and I think it is important to carry this stuff local, and I believe it, that's not the only place it should be. Again, not counting disk failures, and gee, I don't like this two gig drive, and I want to put something bigger in. Um, is this the right approach? Creating a new space, a new folder in boot. Nobody cares? Yes. Ah, good point. Yeah, so let me ask, I'll repeat the question. I think I have the only mic, right? right? So let me repeat the question. What's the point of keeping it local? Is that right? Because the verifier's got to go get it anyway. Um, off, the, the, the first use case to me would be offline distribution. So my company, for example, if we were to, to move on something like this, you've got industrial controllers out there. You go deploy, just, just an example use case, right? If you've got an industrial controller out there, it sits on the other side of the OT. It sits inside OT. You can't call home to whoever made this thing. You can't cross the boundary, right? So it'd be, I mean, the other choice is to copy all this stuff locally and have it within the, within a provisioner inside. But since this stuff's signed anyway, right, I don't have to worry about somebody tampering with it. I'll detect that. Because I have the root, I have the signer's root key. That I would have had to have gotten, right, by some out of band mechanism. You know, a guy with a briefcase with a, you know, handcuff or a phone call reading thumbprint or whatever, right? That I have to do, as, as, as Ivani described, for any of this. But once I have the root key, I, I, I'm going to go decide if I trust these things or not, right? And putting them here, we couldn't think of a better place to put them because this is the thing that, in theory, doesn't change until you swap out the hard drive. And if you go blow this away, well then, you know, you, you, have, you have other things going on if you start blowing away your boot partition anyway, right? You, you've done it for another reason. So, yeah, I mean, that, but it is a problem if you don't save this and you need it, then that's a problem. So. Any other? Everybody likes this stuff? Well, cool. All right. I guess we're done early for everybody. So, and if anybody wants to hang around afterwards, um, you know, it'd be interesting to have a um, a boff if you know people can leave that aren't really interested, and I'll be happy to hang around. And uh, since this is the last session, this would be the time for boffs anyway. And I'll make myself available, and anybody that wants to join in, that would be. Uh, that would be great. So with that, I'll turn this over to you. Okay, thanks, Ivani and Monty.